the second time that the Confederates decided to go up into Union territory was at Gettysburg, which is located in Pennsylvania. The furthest north that any battle ever happened in the Civil War was in Pennsylvania. The only battle that was fought in the Civil War that was in a free state as opposed to the slave states. So Gettysburg represented a big step for the Confederacy. It was a move that I'm sure if you would have asked any Confederate general that would, they would have regretted doing this. The reason they made this decision a second time, the first time being in Antietam, the reason that the Confederates made this decision was uh, many of the same reasons that they went into Antietam, hoping to get the border states to secede with a victory, um, hoping to get recognition and help financially, militarily from France, Great Britain, or both. Um, you know, wanting to, another reason would be, you know, wanting to relieve the pressure coming down on them by going up into the north and, you know, basically punching them, the north in the mouth and, and then coming back down and stopping the, the flow coming down on them. And then to take advantage of some momentum. You know, Fredericksburg and Chan Chancellorsville that I just talked about were battles that, that were victories for the Confederates. And if you look at the Confederates, you know, when the wins versus losses, the Confederates have won way more than they've lost at this point. You know, never before this had they been, they, they, never had they been in the situation, the good situation they were again after this. Um, they had won at uh, battles like Bull Run 1, Bull Run 2, another one that we haven't talked about. Um, they won at uh, the Peninsula Campaign, at Fredericksburg, at Chancellorsville. So they've won some big victories. Now the Union's also went in victories too, uh, but you know at this point, this it's still this is 1863 when this battle happens, and the Confederates were still in darn good shape until Gettysburg. Once they lose at Gettysburg, then they're never going to fight an offensive battle again. It's all going to be a defensive battle, and it's you know a steady. Um, flow to the to the end of the war after Gettysburg. So just to to set the scene, the, the the battle took place in a small town that today would be about the size of Gonzales, and you, you can imagine if you know you had uh, one hundred seventy thousand or six one hundred sixty thousand, one hundred fifty to one hundred sixty thousand men in Gonzales all firing their weapons. It was it was uh, crazy, to say the least. So the Union had about 92,000 men, the Confederacy about 76,000 men, all converging on the town the size of Gonzales, the town known as Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg lasted uh, July 1st through 3rd, so it was a three-day battle, and the the uh, death toll is going to be really high. None of those single days was more than the 22,000 plus that died at Antietam, but altogether a lot of men, we'll talk later about casualty numbers um, later on here, but um, you know, I'll talk more about some of the specifics of the Battle of Gettysburg, but in the end, on the third day, there was an attempt made by General uh, George Pickett to try to charge up the hill and take this hill, and they got slaughtered. They had um, uh, many taken prisoner of war, many killed. Uh, at Gettysburg and the, the battle ended and the Confederates retreated and went back down to the Confederacy. So it's a huge Union victory, um, to say the least. Uh, some pictures here, Th this is, a, you can see here, very common at Gettysburg. Obviously they have Civil War reenactments, beautiful grounds there. There's a monument in the background. Uh, you, everybody's probably heard of the Gettysburg Address and let's talk a little bit about the Gettysburg Address. It was uh, a speech that was written by Abraham Lincoln on the train ride up to Gettysburg from Washington, D.C. The purpose of the speech that Lincoln gave was to dedicate a cemetery to all the fallen Union soldiers. Um, not Confederates were not allowed to be uh, buried in Gettysburg Cemetery. So Lincoln is dedicating that cemetery, so he gave a speech. He followed a guy who spoke for way too long. 
like over an hour. This guy spoke. It was super hot on that day, really humid. Um, when when uh, Lincoln gave this quick two minute speech, and people were really relieved by the fact that it was so short. But the words that he spoke were just definitely lasting, sustainable. Um, we still read it, and I'll read this in class. We'll talk about it. We'll break it down. But just understand that the Gettysburg Address is one of the most important speeches ever uttered by an American president. Um, so, yeah, and he basically is setting the scene saying this war is not over. We're going to dedicate ourselves to ending it so that those who died here at on this hallowed ground, he called it, would not have died in vain. And uh, they need to finish the job that is bringing the union back together. I'm just paraphrasing, but I'll, in class, we'll break it down a little bit more. <laughs> uh, some of the memes going around here, you know, so some of the funny stuff that's so four score and seven years ago, four sets and seven reps ago. Civil War jokes, I generally don't find them funny. So I don't know, some of you might think those memes are funny, so maybe not, but I do. I think they're funny. There's a picture of Gettysburg Gem uh, Gettysburg Cemetery. Okay, the Battle of, of Vicksburg along the Mississippi River that secured the Mississippi River for the Union. That was Remember, that was one of their objectives, was to take the Mississippi River, part of the Anaconda Plan, with two victories, one victory at New Orleans and the second one up the river a little bit in uh, Mississippi, uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, and, and, the, and the river was secure. The, the uh, victory was led by Admiral Farragut of the United States Navy, who uh, the first victory, I'm sorry, was at New Orleans. Farragut was the hero at New Orleans. And then uh, Ulysses S. Grant was the hero at Vicksburg. So we'll talk about Ulysses S. Grant here in a second. But just know and understand that after the Battle of Vicksburg and New Orleans, the river was secure. OK, Grant, Abraham Lincoln had changed the leader of the Army of the Potomac none less than eight times. You had McClellan in there twice, and you had guys like Meade and Pope and um, a host of others that were uh, McDowell that were in in and out. Uh, but but he had a quick hook. <laughs> you know, I mean, when something didn't go right, he changed. Uh, his guy that he knew he wanted, but he was really kind of hesitant to to put him in charge was Ulysses S. Grant. Hesitant because he was a mediocre student at West Point, closer to the bottom of the class than the top. Um, he was a guy who definitely was uh, understood the uh, ideas of mass when it comes to war, you know, throwing all, all your resources at, at the uh, opponent. By resources, I mean men. They, he understood that the Union had more men than the Confederacy did, and the first waves were going to, you know, when they went into Richmond, were going to die, and they kind of knew that. Uh, that was his his thing. He was more blood and guts than um, McClellan was, but he was winning. He was fighting battles in Tennessee and then obviously Vicksburg. So he was winning out in the West. Whereas in the East, where some of the major battles were, uh, the Union was suffering. So Abraham Lincoln kind of took a, took liberties and made him the leader of the Army of the Potomac in spite of his, you know, drink, uh, you know severe drinking problem that he had. He was uh, very much an alcoholic. Uh, he cussed a lot and bottom of his class. But Abraham Lincoln said, hey, you know, I'm going to forget about that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I need to have this guy in charge of the Army of the Potomac, and he becomes the last guy, and he, he's the one who sees it through, and later on will become President of the United States. Let's talk a little bit about one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the important figures in the Civil War history, and that's uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, who was given command, uh, and this is, you could kind of see very much Grant in, in this guy and the decisions that he, he makes. There was desperation. By 64, there's desperation. I mean, this war had been going on since 61, and the death toll was mounting, and the 
uh, Union was frustrated. The people were beginning to lose interest in the war up in the north. And if that's the case, then, you know, you're going to have a hard time winning. So they knew it was desperation time. So uh, William Tecumseh Sherman was was uh, told to um, march to the sea. So he started in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and and worked his way over to Atlanta and to Savannah, Georgia, along the coast. And he was he told his men, take nothing with you. We're going to live off the land and we're going to destroy everything in our path. That meant mansions, stately mansions that were owned by plantation owners. That meant buildings that meant killing livestock so the food would run out. It meant burning fields and, and just making life generally miserable in the South so that they would surrender. You're trying to beat them so badly that they would surrender. And it worked because the men that were fighting up around Richmond and those areas of Virginia, they heard about what was going on down in the South. And a lot of them were leaving the Confederate army to come back home to protect their family and their property. And so with this, you know, whittling away of the size of the Confederate army, uh, definitely it was given the advantage to the Union as time went on. So not only were they doing what they wanted to do is cut off supply lines by destroying railroads. They were called Sherman corkscrews where they would, they would heat the, the rails and then bend them upward so that trains couldn't use them anymore. They were doing that. They were just destroying um, the transportation, modes of transportation that they were able to use, especially railroads, so that they couldn't get troops and they couldn't get supplies you know, to the fighting men up north. And it was working in that way, but the, the biggest factor was the uh, leaking of the men from the uh, army, the Confederate army. And you could see that some of the historic towns, cities like Charleston just left in ruins, it looked like a nuclear bomb went off. That's all done with cannonballs too. And dynamite. Okay, in, in the uh, middle of war, we had an election. There was talk in 1864 of suspending the election, just like there was talk in 1944 when we were involved in World War II and Roosevelt was going uh, to try to get reelected re for a fourth time. There was talk about suspending the election, but in both occasions, they said no. Heck, there was talk went during the pandemic in 20, 2020, this year, the previous year of suspending the election. But in both cases, they uh, talked about history and they talked about 64, 1864, 1944. So all that talk about suspending the election was put aside. Abraham Lincoln is running for reelection. Uh, early on in his campaign in 62, 63, and then getting into 64, he was losing support. And the reason being is because the war wasn't going well. Um, he appeared to be indecisive by changing the leader of the Army of the Potomac eight times, and people don't like that. So there was this uh, anti-Lincoln movement going on that they wanted to get him out. He's going against Democrat George McClellan, who he had fired twice as, as general. And now McClellan's run, running for president. Um, so Abraham Lincoln, in a desperate move that has lasting impact, even in 2021, this is big, he decides to dump his vice president, Harry Hamlin, and bring on Andrew Johnson to be his vice president in 64. Get this, Andrew, Jans Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee, a seceded state. He was a slave owner and he was a Democrat. Yes, Abraham Lincoln picked a Democrat, Andrew Johnson, who was a slave owner to be his vice president. Why? because he felt he needed border state support in order to win the war. He felt he needed Missouri and Kentucky and Delaware and Maryland to win. That's why he picked Andrew Johnson. Now think about the implications of that. Abraham Lincoln should have known or understood that if he died, 
I don't know, maybe was assassinated. If he was assassinated, then you'd have a, a slave owner in charge here during the Civil War at the time the Civil War was going on. This is a big blunder by Ab on Abraham Lincoln's part. And it's going to have lasting impact on history even today. Right. Lincoln gets a lot of credit for a lot of things that he did. The biggest one ending the war and 13th Amendment that ended slavery. However, this is a huge mistake on his part. And you will begin to understand what I mean by that as we get into the peace after the war is over, after his death. So anyways, yeah, we'll get into that as we go. The Battle of Richmond, the, the ending battles of the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant told his men in the front lines to write their name and address and pin it inside their jacket so that when they die, they know where to send the body. I mean, that's his, I mean, his philosophy is throw all your resources at the enemy, knowing that you're going to lose a lot of them. But in the end, because you have more than they do, you're going to win. And that is what happened at Richmond. In this series of wilderness encounters out there in, in Virginia, uh, Grant, the, the Union lost about 50,000 lives in a couple days period. 7,000 died at Cold Harbor within a few minutes. It was bloody, it was nasty, but in the end, this is what, this is what gets the, the, the Confederates to surrender. Lee, in a series of letters back and forth to um, Grant during April, over a three or four week period, finally Grant convinced Lee to surrender. Lee could have gone on. He could have. They could have gone guerrilla warfare and, and went into the hills and attacked. This thing could have gone on for years. But Lee made a decision. He says, the time is now. We need to heal the wounds and get this thing over with. So at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, that's a, that's a town. Appomattox Courthouse is a town. Lee surrendered to Grant in someone's living room. And I told you that I was going to tell you a little bit more about where the Civil War started and ended. Well, the Civil War started in the front yard of a guy's house. And that guy decided, I'm out of here. This war is going to happen. There's going to be battles here all the time. That was at Bull Run Creek, Manassas, Virginia. And he said, I, I don't want to be. And in fact, there was another battle. There's Bull Run too. There's a, a second battle at Manassas Creek. But And this guy had left. He goes, I, I don't want to be anywhere near this. So he moves south to what he thought was a safer area. He bought a house in, you guessed it, Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. That house became the, the, the site of the meeting between Lee and Grant, who knew each other socially and shook hands and talked like old friends in this guy's living room. And they hammered out an agreement, a ceasefire. And the ceasefire simply said, Grant told Lee, take your men, take your horses, leave your guns, keep your swords, go home. That's it. Very easy terms. He even allowed them to keep their horses because he said, you know, you're going to need those horses when you go back down to the South and you find out what's going on with your fields that were burned by Sherman. So yeah, let me say that again. The war started in this guy's front yard and ended in his living room. Different house, but same guy. Another one of those coincidences of history that make you go, is that real? Or is that made up? No, it's not made up. There's, that's what Richmond looked like after the fighting. And there's the guy's living room. And there's uh, Grant on the left and Lee on the right. And there's outside of his house where all their gun, the guns were all put on that, along that fence where the Confederates had to give up their guns. The Civil War casualties, 600,000 plus deaths. 2% of the population. If it were today's numbers, today we have about 318 million Americans. If it was 2%, that would mean 6.5 million people would die. And you could see the battles there, Gettysburg being the biggest, 51,000 lives lost over a three-day period. You see Antietam at the bottom there, but 
that's the only one on this list that's one day, 22,720 casualties in one day, bloody civil war. I'll talk a little bit more in class about the women in this pension, pretty interesting story. Andersonville Prison is a site of uh, the Confederates. The Confederates ran this prisoner of war camp. It was pretty disgusting. Um, it was out outside and uh, it was in Georgia. So whenever they capture prisoners of war, they take them here. And it's, it's a, a prison, but there's no bars. There's a fence around it. And it was, you know, the disease everywhere. You can imagine all everybody, you know, going to the bathroom, wherever they go, but the water that's eventually going to flow down to the water. This is their water source right here. It was polluted by urine and feces, human, and people were dying left and right, and they were barely fed at all. Here's a picture of a guy who looks like he's dead, but he's alive. Look at that. That's a guy that came out of Andersonville. Horrible conditions. And the uh, Union soldiers were treated horribly there. It says distributing rations at Andersonville. You're gonna, you, really in the news today is all the uh, so, uh, Confederate monuments that have been taken down. And this is one that's uh, one that they're talking about destroying. They haven't yet. Uh, this is uh, in Georgia, Stone Mountain, Georgia, and it, on this, uh, in this carving, you have the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, along with General Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, and it was completed in 1972. The death of Abraham Lincoln. Um, I'm not going to get into detail on the death of Abraham Lincoln here on, the, on this uh, recording, but I will be talking about it in detail in class, I'll break it down, uh, break down that day and what happened on that awful day in, on April 14th, 1865, when Abraham Lincoln decided to go to the theater to relax and watch Our American Cousin, that was the name of the play. And he was shot by none other than John Wilkes Booth. It was a huge conspiracy. There was a plan out there to kill the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state. The president, obviously Lincoln, they were successful. The vice president Johnson, the guy who was supposed to do that, uh, chickened out. The guy who was supposed to kill um, the secretary of state um, was almost successful. He broke into his house and stabbed him a bunch of times, but the guy lived. Um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be discussing that in more detail in class, and I'll bring up these pictures so you can see it too. But there's the weapon that he used, and we'll talk about. John Wilkes Booth's escape and then capture and killing. And then lastly, we'll talk about um, the hanging, the conspiracy, the, the Lincoln conspiracy that, that occurred where Mary Surratt became the first woman in American history to be um, executed or hanged. She was the owner of the tavern that they met where they met. And that is the end of this chapter and the next chapters we're going to be talking about reconstruction after the war.